everyone has the point in their life when they discover they love something. Be it going to the game of your favorite team with your dad for the first time, seeing your favorite movie for the first time through, and so many more. Magical moments that inspire us to be a fan or be and do something ourselves. As you probably can tell by the nature of this channel, for me, these are my feelings towards video games. Born in 1994, I always slept late Super Nintendo and N64 along with my big sister and other relatives. But you never forget your first love, your own personal console. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. Pack up your stuff! In the year 2001, times changed for young Dominic, as his dad decided to buy a Sony PlayStation for the family. And with family, I mean Dominic. Now being honest about it, the first game I played from start to finish was Crash Bandicoot 3. And oh man, I played that game so much, sometimes I wouldn't even bother to put my memory card in because it didn't matter if I had to start from the beginning cause I had so much fun playing any level. I didn't get a new game for a few months and didn't have the money to just buy something. You know, with me being 6 years old and all, I didn't exactly have the money in the bank. Another thing was getting the PS1 on Christmas day and my birthday is the 14th of December, so I was happy with what I got from my parents and couldn't even imagine getting something else for quite some time. But how wrong I was all these years ago. One day, I remember sitting in our living room when my dad came home from work and he had a surprise for me. He told me that a colleague at work made copies of PS1 games and I could play them on my console. I couldn't even begin to understand what that meant, but anyway, on this day, my dad had three sets of different colored CDs with him. In the first set of silver CDs, there was written with a sharpie, Final Fantasy VII. On the second set of black ones, oddly fitting in retrospective, Final Fantasy VIII. And on the last set of big, bright green discs, Final Fantasy IX. Neither my gaming knowledge nor my English skills were good enough to know what that meant, but I knew that 9 is bigger than 7 so I decided to put in the green disc first. And really, that is where it started, my love for video games. I play games when I'm sad, when I'm bored and when I'm happy. Countless stories and world explored, I tested my abilities against other players off and online. All these feelings because of the ninth entry of the popular Japanese IP. I love this game. In fact, so does serious creator Hironobu Sakaguchi, as this game captures everything a Final Fantasy game should be. I like nine, of course. Final Fantasy Nine is the best. Well, you heard it here uh, from the man himself. So here you go. Um. The project itself is, after the 3D shift in more or less really realistic games like Seven and Eight, a love letter to the beginning of the franchise. A fairy tale-like adventure about fantastical kingdoms and a merry band of thieves, knights, wizards and a princess. Of course, there's more to the story than that, but that is what is sold to you on the back of the box. Over the last years, I discovered that this was the reason that led a lot of people to dislike 9, because they didn't want that kid stuff, only wanted cool soldiers and gun blades, maybe a key if they like Disney. Nowadays the game has something of a cult following of people that love it with all of their heart, like me. In fact, I now own this game on PlayStation, PlayStation Classic Downloads, PS4 and Steam. Oh, and in the future, a Switch version will be bought, I guess. As a side note, the back text of my German version of the game is quite special. Not only does it spoil major plot points of the game about Queen Brain and magical weapons, but it also claims that Zidane is the leader of Tantalus, trying to put an end to her plan, which is just not true for the most part. Starting a new game, you're greeted with the intro FMV, set in a terrible storm and two girls fighting for their lives against the towering waves. 
But oh, it's just a bad dream of a young beautiful princess. Hmm. Leaving bad thoughts behind, she looks out the window, getting a good look at the huge airship arriving over the castle town of Alexandria. Also watching from the street levels is a little boy in the classic clothes of the black match attire, amazed by the very same ship. The wooden airship is gigantic, with many different decks and beautiful statues as decoration. As the camera pans inside, we get the first look at our protagonist, a blond boy with a Son Goku-like monkey tail. He ventures into a dark room and exclaims to a to us unknown voice that his name is Sidan. I remember naming everybody after myself, family and friends, playing this for the first time, but now I always go for the game given name if there is a preset the way it should be. As soon as the candles in the middle are lit, Sidan's friends join you in the chamber and suddenly you are attacked by a strange man wearing a dragon mask. With sound effects included. FF9 returns to the classic chop system and turn-based combat of the old games, so instead of everybody being able to cast magic via material draw system, you, for example, get a dedicated black mage or dragoon for your party. Each member has a normal attack, a special class-based ability, like jump or summoning, and different types of magic skills, like white or blue magic, and everybody is able to use items. Now of course, this means that certain characters are just better suited for certain areas than others. But due to the fact that your party is ever changing during the adventure, you will be using everyone. But as always, you'll have your four favorites by the end of the game. Don't worry though, I think everybody is fine enough to play, so you never feel stuck with anyone. Back to our current first battle of the game, our party consists of four thieves, as eagle eyed viewers can guess because of the big steel button everyone has. For some reason, poor Senai often gets hit the hardest during this fight, don't know why, but even so, after grabbing some stuff, you make short work of your foe. The man reveals himself to be Baku, the leader of the Tentalus Thief Band and Rebelling Theater Group that Zidane, Blanc, Marcus and Senna are part of. They came to Alexandria for a very special reason. Under the guise of an acting group, the outlaws plan to perform the famous I want to be your canary during the 16th birthday celebration in honor of Princess Garnet of Alexandria and use the festivities as cover to kidnap the very same. This play is also the reason the shy black mage kid Vibi came to the castle town. To his determined on top of tripping repeatedly, his ticket is a fake, so he has no choice but, despite his fear of heights, go to a show with his new rap boyfriend via the rooftops of Alexandria. The play itself shows just how much love is put into this game. Everybody in the Chiefs crew plays a role in the play. It's complete with its own music, show battles and special effects. The art style of these gorgeous cutscenes make them hold up a lot better than say 8 or 7s, of course only in a graphical point of view. The PS4 or Steam version, which I'm playing here, makes in-game models look much nicer than the original. A feature I wished would also be used for the background images, but there are patches for this. If you play the PC version, that's probably as close as we get for a full blown remake. Even so, I find the backdrops to still be really beautiful and super interesting from an art standpoint, I just wish they could be in a higher resolution. Every time the backgrounds go from a static model to a 3D one, I remember how cool it was and how it blew my mind. As the princess seems to take a long time away from her seat, Good boy Adelbert Steiner, captain of the Knights of Pluto, is tasked by the queen herself to look for her. The disguised princess passes by Zidane and Blank, which leads to a spontaneous chase sequence.
Finally stopping running away, the girl asks the surprise bandit to kidnap her and bring her to the neighborhood kingdom of Limpbloom. The boy accepts, as that was his goal anyway, but well, he couldn't imagine what he got himself into. You can guess her mother isn't too happy about this and drew some major hijinks and fighting, the airship manages an escape over the price of crash landing in the fittingly named Evil Forest. That is enough story for now. This video is more me talking about why I love this game than a story recap. During the course of your playthrough, your party members only increase stats by leveling up, but never gain new moves. Of course, you don't simply stay the same, but instead, moves and passive abilities are tied to your equipment. For example, one staff might have the better magic attack stat, but the one you want to use is the one that lets you use the fire off spell, as it is the strongest spell to cast. Use these items enough and you're able to cast without having the corresponding item it equipped. This is a genius system as it allows you to skip a lot of grinding in a second playthrough when you already know which tactics you want to use in an upcoming fight. In fact, this feature allows speedrunners to complete the game without ever leveling up once. Which is insanely cool if you ask me. If I had to describe fighting in FF9, I'd call it simple, but smooth. It's classic turn-based combat, JRPG action at its finest. I already described abilities, turns and classes. And really, other than that, there's only a simple front and back row system in place. Nothing to write home about. Party members in the front line take more damage while also dealing more themselves. Well, for the most part. There are some exceptions like abilities and classes like Dragoon or Ninja. But generally speaking, close combat fighters should go to the front lines. That just leaves us with the trend system. Yeah. If anything, I respect them for trying something different. Dropping the popular limit break attack for something new. The problem? Trend sucks. As Steiner kindly explains, it's a transformation triggered by a strong emotional response. And yeah, it is pretty much going super Saiyajin. In addition to a stat boost and glowing pretty, most characters gain access to special commands, like Vivi's double cast and Fire Spear Ray. It works well enough in the scripted story moments for sure, but other than these, the only way to get the power up is getting hit to fill up your transmitter. And even though he has an ability to gain more meter faster, it still takes a lovable long time for a game in which random encounters hit you really sparely. Even worse, there's no way to store it, meaning it will trigger as soon as the bar hits 100% and you go into the mode for a couple of turns for that fight only. Of course, this is also pretty bad in multi-phase fights or boss rushes. An option to store and pop it whenever would have been really good. Then again, the power-up is only really useful with a couple of characters and is pretty useless in endgame anyway. I like that it gets a lot of story relevance for the antagonist in the final of the game. It's always super cool if the bad guy uses what you have, but better. Doesn't make me want to use it more though. During your stay in the foreboding forest, you experience something I'd wish a lot more games with a party would use the so-called active time events. These basically are little cutscenes showing you what your friends are doing during your stay at a location. They are really good for fleshing out the characters of your buddies, give you hints on secret areas and a good way to show you where you need to go to advance the story. I vastly prefer them to insequential party bender. So many RPGs Do you have any tales of the wild? None of the sort you like. No princesses in tall towers or knights throwing themselves at whole armies. That's not all I like. Do you want tales of the chastened wilders who dwell in the marsh? 
Do you want to hear of the slow deaths they inflict on their enemies? Perhaps a tale of the poisonous creatures of the wilds that lay their eggs on your skin so their young may eat you alive when hatched? Or a tale of my mother's marsh cuisine? That, in my opinion, is the most terrifying of all my tales. Uh, no. I don't want to hear about those things. Then I have no tales for you. <laughs> It is actual interaction, instead of snarky remarks thrown at each other's heads. Not that these can't be funny, but I like a good mix of both. Especially in this game, as everything from character to the world is burned into my memory. Every side character from Sid the Buck King to some street vendor selling pickles has so much charm and personality, it makes me wonder why they decided that everything from 12 onward should be mostly boring human characters quest givers interchangeable and colorless next to your boy band group. The world takes you from different kingdoms to steampunk cities, war-torn ruins, ancient temples, the literal underworld, space and an alternate dimension altogether. That's the thing, for starting with such a cliché and a simple premise of kidnapping a princess, the story quickly turns into save the continent, to save the world, in save the very concept of life and death, somehow. Everybody is super likable, the MC Zidane himself is such a breath of fresh air in comparison to the pretty sad boys that are cloud and square. He is generally a funny and likable thief. He's trying to do the right thing, helping his friends and even helps his enemies cause it's the right thing to do. I know the thief with a heart of gold is a trope as old as time itself, but for this game it just works. Also in the Cydia games his design hilariously clashes with everyone else, making him stick out from the heap of people with deep personal problems and leather clad attire. <laughs> Squall, wait! Hmm? What is it? Uh, is it another summon? I think so. Maybe we should split up. Uh, I see where you're coming from, but... How far? It's closer than the other one. I'll keep going after this one. What? Hold on! You're gonna go alone? It'll be easier that way. He's just having a great time as everybody is kinda lamenting the frequency of fate and stuff. As a thief, of course, he is also a flirty ladies man, but even that is played for laughs and he gets a taste of how annoying this can be for other people exposed to aggressive flirting and really drops the antics once the story gets rolling. Even in this moment of self doubt, finding out that he is an alien prototype from another world, at the slowest he just wants to keep going with his friends, a lesson that takes most Final Fantasy protagonists hours to realize. The developers knew that through the decision of always being in your party, as long as he is around, story-wise, he needs to be likable and useful in combat, which he always stays, as one of the strongest fighters even through just buying equipment and not doing any side missions, being able to steal strong equipment from bosses and having strong moves and trends early on. Zidane is always leading the group and pushes them on during your journey. Steiner, the clumsy strong-headed knight captain, who loyally follows his orders and blind belief of his monarchy. He never gets annoying in his ways, instead constantly learns why his way of thinking is flawed, sometimes in a funny and sometimes in a tragic way. Through his experiences and talking with other characters with different worldviews, he becomes a better version of himself while still staying a proud soldier. Vivi is my favorite in 9. Starting out as a cowardly black mage who drips a lot, more dragged along than being part of the story, he turns into one of the most important characters for one of the game's central themes, death. Thinking for oneself and what it really means to live. Yes, you had that right, this guy is a medium for the horrors of senseless war and existential threat. 
Similar to the main character, Riri is one of the mass-produced black mage puppets, created by the villain of the story Kucha, solely for the purpose of war. As an unforeseen side effect, these machines of war develop a sense of self-questioning their existence and orders they blindly followed before, ultimately learning that their lifespan is strongly limited and fear the concept of death as they can't even cross living in the time they are given. Best Black Mage 10 out of 10 Even the two characters are like the least, both being a mix of White Mage and Sumner have enough going on for them to not be unlikable and the reason for not being one character. First, we have the MC's love interest and in my mind, the almost secondary protagonist, Princess Garnet. The first fear is, of course, that she is the cookie cutter princess character and so on, but uh, not really. She is just a girl wanting to help her estranged mom. The only weird thing is that she kinda goes through the same character arc, with her being at the low point of the bad events in the story, but she cuts her hurt short the second time so you know she's serious this time around. Uh, I'm kidding of course. I like the idea of a character being traumatized so he or she doesn't speak anymore and is kinda off during battle. Of course meaning that I'm not like gonna use her during those times because Aaron has to be mid-maxed. Garnet, codenamed Dagger, doesn't reach the upper echelons of female characters in Final Fantasy, but she's sold at mid-tier. Aiko, on the other hand, is hilarious and maybe my go-to in showing how to write a likable kid party member in an RPG. Looking at you, you little shit. I'll make you remember what you did to her! I'm gonna kill you! Not only does she have an interesting backstory, heavily related to Dagger and the overall story, but she's also a great dynamic with everybody else, side cast included. She reverses the overly flirty dynamic of Sidane and the princess, much to his dismay, but in a kinda cute, innocent crush way, and later after realizing it won't work out, calls them out on the lack of progress. Also, her happy-go-lucky personality in contrast to the little mage questioning his purpose of existence is gold, like Friedrich Nietzsche in a Bruno Mars video or something. Clearly the other three characters are a bit on the weaker side when it comes to story involvement. Don't get me wrong, of course, everyone has their scenes during the game, but as far as real involvement goes, uh, kinda lacking. Freya, the Dragoon from Brumica, is super cool and design-wise my favorite. I always use her in my party and I always make sure to kill those 100 big lizards for her best skill to do max damage. At the time of joining the party, she is super important as the story at this moment takes place in her homeland. After that is over, her scenes are reduced to expressing a desire for revenge against the evil people. That is, of course, a nitpicky complaint, but hey, we all got our favorites and we want to have a lot of cool scenes with them. She also got her side plot about her lost lover, and you meet him pretty quickly, only for the game to play the old memory loss card. And after that, I think the next time you see him is in the epilogue of the story. That's a wasted opportunity. Queener. I like him, her, a lot actually but he she definitely feels dangerously close to a choke character. Now, Queena isn't Cat Sith, which alone is a big plus point for every JRPG character. A lot of the misadventures of the Hungry Gourmet are actually really funny, and in interacting with the world and characters a lot of charm comes through. There is something about a channelist gluttony monster giving hot takes on existential crises that cracks me up, so I can't quite make it out if I like it or not. Queena is a blue mage, and eating enemies to learn new magic is a cool take on the class. Plus, a lot of moves are really useful, so there is an incentive to use Queena in battle, especially after you amassed a big skill list for him her. Amarant, or Salamander Coral in Japanese, is the last party member to join your group, taking the role of the ninja class of the old games. He is super cool as a rival character, well, they tend to be, and really useful in combat. However, I think also the least fleshed out character, as you can straight up ignore his backstory in ATE if you choose to do so. And in the end, he is there to showcase Sidan's character of helping everyone, even if they are enemies. A foreshadowing for the final of the game. It's kinda sad that is all you can say about him. 
And that's it. That is your party. It reaches from cool to super awesome characters and is probably my favorite JRPG gang of all time. Of course, I'm kinda biased in that regard. All the joy, the sadness and experiences. These guys feel like my friends to me. A feeling I almost never have gotten anywhere else. The dungeons, towns and open world are filled to the brink with secrets and side activities for you to explore. From playing mailman for the cute moogles that also function as your save points, to treasure hunting while riding the popular chocobos, giving fairy gemstones to fight the overpowered superboss, and so much more. Like its own in-universe card game, which in fact really is a bit worse than Triple Triad, but still okay. Most of the NPCs have different lines if you come back after the story progresses further and the events have an actual impact on the world itself, making everything feel real and important, like cities getting destroyed or you unlocking new methods of travel. I could go into detail on so much side stuff or talk about the colorful side cast, but the truth is, I just want people to experience that for themselves. So if you take anything away from all of this rambling, it's how much this all means to me and I sincerely hope I got you to try this game for yourselves and just have fun with it. Most people won't have the kind of deep experience I had, but that is okay. I just want folk to enjoy this adventure. The game is pretty much available everywhere for a cheap price. For this video I used the PS4 version, cause it has a lot of quality of life improvements. Like a no random encounter mode, speed up mechanic and a max damage option. All of this either lets you skip parts you don't want to bang your head against and makes grinding levels to play through otherwise normally a breeze. I play it normally till disc 4 and then just get the levels you need nice and easy from the friendly dragons. Purists probably want to play it on the PS1 or the PS Classic on portable and PS3. The best looking version should be the Steam version with some HD texture and background mods but I couldn't get those to run because I'm bad at installing things. From here on out I'm going to talk about the ending of 9 and my thoughts on the overall message. I'll give it time codes in the description in case you all care about spoilers. That begin now! So, the overall theme of the final and during a great deal of the journey is death. The fear of the end, fighting to live your way and accepting that things will come to an end as it is the way of the world. Momento Mori. Now as I write this, it kinda reminds me of this other game I... Beyond the beaten path lies the absolute end. It matters not who you are. Death awaits you. From Zidane and Vivi being created as harboringers of death and asking for the purpose of life, to Bran trying to fill the void in the heart of the death of her beloved husband with the first for conquest and spiraling into killing many innocents. The end is always depicted as something very, we can't grasp and fear. The same can be said for life, as pretty much the whole cast questioned it all the time. Well, surely not him, her. Even after killing something, not unlike a god and Zidane's creator, you're still not any wiser, but in a manner of speaking, Kutcher has truly learned a lesson. Confronted with the truth of his own existence coming to an end way before he can fulfill his goals and dreams, he goes crazy because of his own powerlessness in the face of finiteness. If Kutcher can't live, nobody shall. To reach that goal, he wants to just pull the plug on all of existence, so nobody gets to live or die. Just nothing. The heroes beat him, and in comes a final complaint for a lot of people. Necros, the otherworldly being, comes to the conclusion that if people are so afraid to die that they just kill each other or want to turn to nothing, maybe they yearn for the sweet embrace of death. No pain, no fear, no problems. Now the thing I said earlier about being P3 gets even truer, as Nyx is the same concept. Only done more impressive, but even so to say that he came out of nowhere, I can't agree to that. Still wish they would have worked him in more, maybe starting at the end of this tree. So that's it, 
the video I always wanted to make. I hope you liked it and got to feel a bit of the enthusiasm I have for this game. For me, Final Fantasy IX will always be the place I return to.